Thank you for coming. The big question in your minds right now is probably why are we here? All right, this is uh, the two topics that we're going to discuss today, both equal opportunity and uh, SAPR. Um, critical that everybody understands, and sometimes we have to actually recage ourselves on uh, what's really, really important. The mission that each and every one of you do on a daily basis is phenomenal. Goes without saying that, uh, frankly, you are all carrying a heavy load on your back. Because we work so close together and because we work under a lot of pressure out there at times, sometimes we forget that the people next to us might be going through different, uh, different situations within their own personal life and their professional life. All right? We kind of pretend that those cubicle walls go all the way up to the ceiling and sometimes, you know, we don't believe that people that are in the next cubicle can overhear what's going on in the conversations that are going on within your cubicle. All right? Conversations that could be taken out of context. All right? Or frankly, uh, conversations that if you just get a snippet of it, it might kind of bring somebody to the wrong conclusion. So every so often you need to re-baseline, if you would, the force on what's acceptable behavior within the workplace. Statistics have shown that there's a continuum of harm. Far side is assault. The other side is it starts with jokes, off-color remarks, you know, maybe some prejudice, you know, from previous life or, you know, from your upbringing. The big thing that you're going to get here today, and they do a phenomenal job, both from EO and the Sapper, is um, we all come from different walks of life. We all have been brought up to, uh, you know, believing different things. We all have different religions. We all, you know, frankly, our national origins, our sexual orientation, it can all be different. But when we come together to do a mission, nothing, nothing can get in the way of doing that. All right. So you need to leave some of that, you need to leave that baggage at home. And we're trying to re-baseline everybody today because have we had problems in the A3? Yes. We've had uh, people say uh, a, a joke or remark that, uh, frankly, people chuckle at, but then later on they kind of think, well, that wasn't appropriate. All right? And what we need everybody here to understand is it takes all of us, all of us to ensure that doesn't grow from that to the far end of the spectrum, which ends up in an assault. Because ultimately we want to ensure that everyone here has an environment to work in that's uh, dignity and respect. And that's why we're here today. I actually, the other day, sat through four hours, two hours of EO and two hours of Sapper, and it's phenomenal training. But again, it's going to be phenomenal training if you ask them questions. All right? This is not just a slideshow. This is interactive. And what I would ask for you today, each and every one of you, to listen critically think about what they're talking about, and hopefully walk away from here with something that you learned. Because the statistics are staggering, not only in the military, but frankly in the, in the civilian population as far as the amount of uh, assaults that are happening out there. And uh, you're all gonna shake your head, but when they throw out something like one in five, you know, females in their lifetime, will be assaulted, that, that's incredible. Because everybody here probably knows five people, five, five females in their lives, all right? But it's just not in the female population. It's in the male population as well. So again, what I ask you to do is give your full attention uh, to the individuals as they come through here. The two hours will go quickly, I promise you that. Uh, and frankly, if you have any inputs or any questions following that, please bring them up to me. And I'll either get it to the experts to answer those, or frankly, if you have a suggestion on how to change the training to help us out better, uh, we will definitely do that. Because again, 
Major General Hansen wants to ensure that we rebaseline everybody to ensure that, again, we have an environment that is supporting dignity and respect for all. With that said, EO. Hello, how's everybody doing? Can you hear me in the back? All right. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a video. How's that sound? Do I get stress headaches at work? Yes, definitely. From the moment I get in, it's, Denise, we need this. Denise, we need that. Which is stressful, because my name is Linda. Denise is the other black woman that works here. By 10 a.m., someone in the copy room makes a joke about Kobe Bryant, and everyone looks at me to make sure it's okay. And I smile like it's okay. But really, my head and neck are starting to throb. Then I spend the rest of the afternoon training my interns and answering their questions like, yes, black people use shampoo, and no, I don't know any good reggae clubs around here, and yes, Condoleezza Rice is very articulate. Why do you sound so surprised? And no, I can't tell you where to buy weed. And that's when I reach for Excedrin. New Excedrin for racial tension headaches. Excedrin RT works fast, taking me from, oh no, you didn't, to I wish a mother would. Excedrin for racial tension headaches. Fast relief with hundreds of years of nagging pain. Did y'all like that? I tried to inject some humor into it. I was a crew chief for, well, this thing's loud. I was a crew chief for 10 years, and when I cross-trained, aircraft mechanics, for those of you who don't know what a crew chief is, when I cross-trained into equal opportunity, what do you think my biggest hurdle was coming from that culture? Say, crew chiefs, flight line, language? language? That's it, exactly, because we, we talk a little differently than people say at finance, right? So that was a culture or a mentality that I had to where I would use the F word in every other word. So the first thing my supervisor did was he sat me down and he said, hey, Evan, Sergeant Manis, we got to work on something. And over time, I don't use that word quite as often as I, as I used to, pretty much never. But do you think that was an easy transition? If you say something all the time, that's your habit, that's your thoughts, that's the mentality, do you think that's something easy to, to just stop? and change that behavior? You ever heard the term, it's easier to pick up a bad habit than it is to, to, to get rid of one, like smoking? And that's kind of what we're here today I want to talk about. I, I'm going to talk about policy, definitions of sexual harassment, discrimination, but the mindset, the culture of what we've become as far as what's acceptable and what's not. If I'm sitting there and I'm all smiles, and my, on the inside I may be feeling differently, and that's, that's what we're going to get to today, kind of like that video. All right, so we're going to go over Air Force policy definitions of sexual harassment, behaviors, behaviors that contribute to it, that hinder it, help it, um, effects of sexual harassment, prevention strategies, roles and responsibilities, and then we'll do some scenarios. But I tell you what, if you all give me scenarios, we can skip those scenarios because I like the real world scenarios better. All right, so with that said, Air Force policy stands from DOD policy, right? Okay, so Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, all are on this base. DOD civilians are on this base, and that's where Air Force policy comes from, the DOD policy. And, D and Air Force says it's against Air Force policy to discriminate based on race, color, sex, national origin, and religion. And a subcategory of sex is sexual harassment. Now that's just for the military, so we only get five. Civilians get age, disability, and genetic information non-disclosure act, which means basically companies say, I'm not gonna hire you because you have a history of heart disease and we don't wanna pay your medical bills but we don't see that so much in the federal sector. And then civilians get reprisal under that, under EO communication, whether they participate as a, an interview, an interviewee, a complainant, any, anything like that. So they would file reprisal under us for military, we go to the IG, right? So what's up with that? Does that seem fair as a military member? I get five categories and civilians get eight. Why do you think that is? That's it exactly, sir. Lawful and unlawful discrimination. We discriminate in the military, don't we? We discriminate against disability. If I get wounded downrange and say I lose all my limbs, am I going to stay in the military? Probably going to be medically retired, right? What about age? You got to be a certain age to come in? We discriminate against that? Do we discriminate against genetic information? 
If you have a heart murmur or something like that, you think that's gonna, that could stop or hinder what jobs you want to do in the military. So we do discriminate. It's lawful and unlawful. Race and color, are those the same? What's my race? Everybody's always scared to say it. I just started and you all are in screensaver mode already. <laughs> What's my race? Caucasian white. What's my color? Light brown. Light brown? <laughs> I got a tan. It's white. So why would, we need to, why would we need to differentiate between race and color? So before I answer that, I want to say that um, my job is to educate you on Air Force policy and federal laws, but I'm not here to offend anybody, and if I do, I'm sorry, but that's not my intent. But the example I give is during slavery. Darker-skinned African-Americans were forced to work outside, plowing the fields, manual labor, hard labor, things like that, where lighter-skinned African-Americans were forced to work inside, cooking, cleaning, taking care of the kids, doing the dishes, things like that. Do you think that could create interracial animosity based on one's color? Yeah, so that's why we differentiate, all right? Now, I work for the installation commander, Colonel Kramer. I do this, it's his program, and I do it on his behalf, all right? And I can tell you now, his policy mirrors Air Force policy. How many, time, how many people have heard zero tolerance throughout their career? A lot. Pretty much, right? I always get the question, why do I got to get the same EO briefing every time I PCS or PCA? We know don't discriminate. We know zero tolerance. But it's still happening. Since I've been doing this, I've substantiated formal complaints against an 06, or 06 is, for race, national origin, and sexual harassment discrimination. Um, the, one, the one colonel sat in for the installation commander, because he was a group commander, when he was TDY, because we didn't have a vice at the time. I substantiated formal complaints against E8s for sexual harassment. If you went to the Christmas party that year, and if you were female, or if you're female, you were and or was, you were sexually harassed and or assaulted that night. And he did that in front of his whole leadership. But yet I still get that question. We know don't do it, but it's still going on. All right, so what's, what's the definition of sexual harassment? I say that one, I didn't talk to it on my, my protected category slide. It's unwanted sexual advances or sexual in nature. So if I ask somebody out at work, is, is that sexual harassment? Is that inappropriate? Hey, you want to go out to dinner, get some drinks? Did I just sexually harass that person? Yeah, no, I, hear, I, hear, I kind of hear some mumbling, but I'm not hearing too much. It depends how she takes your... Oh, exactly. How did I do it? Elevator eyes, was there touching? But just very formal, hey, would you like to go out and have some dinner? Just like that. No. But what if I keep asking? Yeah, that's, yeah, because she's, she's already said no, and I keep passing her. Believe it or not, that happens. And I have to sit up here, and people look at me like, we know that. But not everybody does. That culture. When we're sitting around joking, telling the sexual jokes, or reenacting skits from Family Guy. You all know who Family Guy is? South Park. Dave Chappelle. Yeah, you're all, so you're all really in screensaver mode. We're going to have to do something about that. All right. So, but when we're doing that, we're creating that environment. We're condoning that environment. Believe it or not, we get complaints where people open the emails and then they leave their computer for a sec, which, yeah, I know you're not supposed to leave it logged in, but they leave that open and then somebody walks by and sees it. Or we're doing the water cooler conversation and we're making the jokes and everybody there seems to be fine with it. But kind of like that video or that culture, just smile and wave, boys, smile and wave, right? Because we just want to go with the flow. But we're going to condone that behavior, and then now we're affecting what, what's our most important resource? It's our people, right? Take care of our people, take care of the mission. So if we are making that environment, now that person's uncomfortable, decreased job satisfaction, motivation, morale, performance, duties, all that comes into play. So the, the, the top two definitions there are talking about if I sexually harass you and it has adverse effects on your work. So if I'm not going to promote you or put you in for that promotion because you didn't go out on that date with me, does that create a hostile work environment based on employment? 
And the bottom one is the one we see all the time. Because, oh, I didn't, I didn't have an adverse effect on that person's employment status. But when you make the jokes, when you tell the jokes, or you condone it, or you're part of it, the, any of that, you're doing that interferes with the individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Does that make sense? So the way this works is you all say yes, no, give me an answer. My job is to make sure you have the right answer. All right. So, because if, if, if I think you're not listening, I'll have to read all the slides to you, like Ferris Bueller. I'll do it. What's quid pro quo? Somebody want to tell me? Yeah, this for that. Hey, let's go out to dinner. We'll talk about your uh, appraisal. We'll talk about your decoration, your promotion. This for that. That is, that's, that's a big one, too. All right. Hostile work environment. So, military, when can you be subject to a hostile work environment? What, sir? Someone in your section is unhappy. I heard any time. We're on duty 24-7, right? So if we're at the bar, we're at Buffalo Wild Wings, and we're making jokes, or I'm inappropriately elevator eyes at you or whatnot, you can be sexually, you're, you're being sexually harassed, right? So they can come in and file a complaint or let their leadership know, and the leadership can address it. What about civilians? Depends on what? Depends how bad it is. So if we're at Buffalo Wild Wings and I'm sexually harassing that person, and I'm that person's supervisor, and maybe I'm throwing some quid pro quo in there, could we create a nexus between what happened off duty to work? That's the key. If you create that nexus, then we have sexual harassment, assault, discrimination, all that stuff. All right? So. Same-sex sexual harassment. So military, if you feel you're being discriminated against based on uh, anything with the repeal, whether it's same-sex, sexual orientation, anything of that nature, you need to go to your commander or talk to the IG. We do not accept those complaints in the EO office. However, civilians can. You can come in and file. Does that, does that, does that seem fair? You'll hear me say that sometimes because my whole point is, is it fair that we have to subject people to that environment, that they have to feel that way? But no, civilians under federal law, they can file under sex for sexual orientation. And there is same-sex sexual harassment. That was a big one on the flight line. Because people thought it was funny to joke around and do that kind of things, or those kind of things, and that's what, and we would get the complaints. All right, so. And then sexual assault, the big thing with the assault piece is if you come into my office, especially the military and the civilians, you can use the SARC too now. But if you come in as a military member and, you, and you're not sure if it's harassment or assault, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stop and then I'm going to have you go talk to the SARC who's across the hall. And that's not that I'm being rude or I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's the fact that I don't want to take away your, your, you have restricted and unrestricted reporting options. If you tell me of an assault as an EO person, I don't have confidentiality. I'm calling OSI, your commander, and I'm going to hand you off to the SART. Does that make sense? But then what will happen is, is the SART, if she deems it's harassment, she'll push you back to us. And it's not that I'm trying to make you tell your story a hundred times, but we want to make sure you're in the right place. Civilians, you can use the SART too, and I'll refer, I've referred civilians to the SART, but they have unrestricted reporting. So there's OSI and everybody's going to know. All right. So, I kind of want to talk about the behaviors, the perceptions. This is where it gets a little better. Uh, why we act the way we do, all right? So stereotyping, categorizing people in a fixed general manner. But what I want to know is the culture. How do we get that way? What, depending on what book you read, everybody between the ages of 18 and 22, is, is, that's who you are pretty much. Your version of right, wrong, indifferent, how you see the world. Your value systems are set, all right? And what do you think contributes to those value systems? Are you born prejudice? Are you born hating Brussels sprouts? I, I, I always get somebody says they were, because uh, I don't like them either. No, it's a learned behavior, right? So where do you think those value systems start? Yeah, your parents. It starts with your parents. What, 
Parents teach you right, wrong, all that great stuff. What do you think the next start is in your value systems? Uh, well, it'd be teachers. Right now, my kids are in school, and they're with their teacher more during the day than they are with me or, or, or my wife. So if they have a positive or negative value, belief, stereotype, do you think that could be passed on to my kids? Yeah. What's the next one? Peers. Yep, that was it, Chief. Peers. Your friends, coworkers. Come on, try a cigarette. Want a beer? That's good. But do you think coworkers can influence you just like friends can? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Reprisal, you want to be one of the part of the crowd or the good old boy system, I hear that one a lot. You want to be in the conversation with the water cooler. So if you say something, you're going to alienate yourself, right? A lot of people feel that way. What's the next stage? The final one I'll talk about. What about media? Everything on Fox News is 100% accurate, right? Yeah. I look at pictures of, uh, in the Middle East uh, in our, of Iraq and the cities and on the rooftops. What do you think I see a lot of? Yeah, yeah satellite dishes. And they're watching TV. What do you think they're watching? American television, maybe? So they're watching what? Jersey Shores, the Cardassians, MTV. What do you think their perception is of uh, America or the West? A little different, isn't it? But that, that's their value systems. All right. What do y'all, and I want y'all to kind of look around at the hands as I ask this question. Who saw, in this picture, there's a, there's a few things to see. Who saw the uh, older couple first? Who saw the, the golden cup first? Who saw the, the, the two individuals with the sombreros on their head? See the left hand? Who saw the uh, lady walking through the doorway, the, the guy's ear, the older guy's ear? And I always have to ask this, who saw everything at once? I usually get one. All right. But see, that's our value systems, our perceptions, how we view the world. That influences how you see things. Your filters. Everybody has a filter. Like when I was on the flight line, that F word, that was my filter. That was like saying any other word. It wasn't a bad word to us. We knew it was a bad word, but it didn't, didn't make me flinch. Now, if, when I go on the flight line, I hear that. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like somebody's hit me, you know? So... All right, so the frog and the horse are the same picture. I had to turn that, so I had some individuals who couldn't see it that well. Y'all see it? Who, all right, who saw the ships? Bottom right, there's the ships and the bridge. Who saw the ships first? Who saw the bridge first? Everything at the same time? A lot of less hands. The iceberg represents what's on top isn't necessarily what lies beneath. So, for example, we're at that water cooler and we're having that conversation in sexual nature or harassing, discriminatory, whatever. I'm smiling on the surface, but down below, underneath, do you think everybody's feeling that way? you think everybody's thinking it's funny? But yet we still do it. It's the mentality for some. And it's not getting changed. When all you have to do is say, hey, that's inappropriate, please stop. 99% of the time, EO, sexual harassment, under the EO purview, can be stopped through communication. I, I'll give you an incident. I, I had a guy I worked with, he didn't like being called boss. And by a reasonable person standard, do you think, anybody in here think it's discriminatory if I call my boss boss? No, it's not. But he was from the South, and during slavery, that was the term used between slaves and slave owners. They would call him boss. So, you know, there were two things I could do. I could either stop calling him boss, or I could keep calling him boss because I'm not really discriminating, right? But then I would have had to go through the decreased morale, motivation. We probably would start not getting along, hating each other. Supervisor may have stepped in, sat us down, tried to facilitate something, to get us talking. A lot of time wasted right there. A lot, of, a lot of unhappy feelings. Or I could just stop calling him boss. What do you all think I did? I stopped calling him boss. Now I told him, I said, look, just like that F word, I've been using this for a long time. So it's going to take me a while to totally get that out. So I may slip a couple of times, and I'm not doing it to offend you. Just let me know. Remind me, please. And, and, and I'm going to try my best. And I did slip a couple times. He let me know. But then we, we stopped. And we got back to where we needed to be because he said, 
hey, could you stop doing that, please? But sometimes we get so stuck on what we want and not thinking about the other person or what's best for the unit or the, or the HR, human relations climate. Funny or offensive? Depends on the context. So I always ask, and I, and I with my uh, younger airmen, I ask them the question. I say, who thinks this funny? So in here, it's not a trick question. Who thinks this funny? You all scared? Do you think you're going to get in trouble if you raise your hand? <laughs> but the airmen, most of them will raise their hand. And then I will say, OK, who's, who thinks their parents would think this is funny? And usually, maybe a third of the hands go down, but there's still quite a bit. And then I say, okay, who's grandparent? Who, who do you think's grandparents would think this is funny? And then I have like one hand. Everybody's hand goes down. Genre, age genre, right? Baby boomers, millennials, generation Xers. We all have different value systems, different perceptions in a way we view right, wrong, funny, and different. Don't we? No? Yeah? <laughs> we do. Because when I grew up, if you grew up in the 40s, it was a different time than growing up in the 60s. And then even a different time, maybe in the 80s, 90s, things like that. All right. So I had one guy, he said, no, this is fine. I said, would you let your daughter wear that shirt? And he said, well, no. You know, a shirt with one of those on there. And I said, does your daughter walk around all day looking at her, looking at her chest or her shirt? And he's like, no. But I'm like, but you'll wear it. Well, who do you think she's looking at? Herself or you? It wasn't okay for his daughter to wear it because he didn't want that, you know, to influence her or her to see that, but he's wearing it on his shirt. She's staring at him all day. Didn't make sense to me. And that's things we don't think about. All right, so what are some of the behaviors? The jokes, the innuendos, the emails. I had a, I had a guy, he, um, he took a, a picture of himself in his underwear flexing in the dorms. And he emailed it to a fellow coworker at work, female. She didn't like it. So she sent it to the commander. That's how I got to my office. <laughs> Don't do that. I mean, and it sounds funny, or it, I mean, it's funny, but at the same time, people do this stuff. You get, when, I was, when I was a crew chief, the, the computers were against the wall, so everybody in the, in, the, in the office could see what you were doing. And it would say, click on this cool dirt bike pic. That was when the internet first came out, email for the military. And um, you click on it, it'd be like, it'd say downloading porn, and it'd just take up the whole screen, or it'd have Eric Estrada dance with no shirt on. People are still sending that stuff. It's funny, and nobody can tell you what you think, what, you, what should and shouldn't be funny to you. And it's just like a prejudice. Everybody has prejudices, and that's fine. You can hate Brussels sprouts. But it's when you act on that prejudice and make it known that when it becomes an issue. The, the leering and staring, we, we get that a lot. I've had that done by individuals to EO people while they're interviewing them for a complaint. Like literally the elevator eyes and all that stuff. A lot of times we have these behaviors and we're not consciously aware sometimes. I think that person was aware. But my point is, is help the other person. Say, hey, look, did you know you were kind of lingering a little bit or staring? Remember, you don't have to do it by yourself. You can have a friend. You can send them an email. You can go to your leadership, lowest level possible. Or you can come to our office. Uh, the physical, this has changed. It used to be if, um, neck massage, unsolicited shoulder rubs. That was sexual harassment. Now with the new UCMJ rules and the laws, any kind of touching, any kind of touching on the arm, whatever, can be construed as assault and will be processed as a crime. It depends. All right? So don't, don't touch people. <laughs> that's, that's the easiest way to do it. All right. So what are some of the effects? Can somebody tell me? What, what happens if some, how's it going to affect the unit or that person if someone's being sexually harassed or discriminated against? As a minimum, the person receiving it is going to be less effective. But more than likely, the whole organization is going to suffer. Right. So it starts with the person, right? Medical bills, um, depression, <coughs> low morale, no job satisfaction 
production, and then that can spill over into the environment, right? And then start affecting everybody else and just domino effect out. Did you know the average formal complaint for civilians is $36,000? That's just to process it. That's not even if there's a fining or a judgment for money. That's just what it costs for to pay the lawyers, you know, me, my 36 cents an hour that I make, um, and everybody else. The victim impact, I kind of, I've already talked to this, the decreased job satisfaction, morale, workload, so. And then the impact on the family. But, so, but I keep saying communication. It, with the younger M, and I do this game, it's called, I call it rumor mill, but has anybody ever heard of telephone? Where I gave a message, and then it goes, like, so it'd be too big in here. Actually, we could just have you all move over here. No, I'm just kidding. And we, we start here, and we come over here with the message, and it's always different. I think I can count on one hand how many times the message has been the same, and I've been doing the same message for eight and a half years. All right? And so I'll come in, and I'll say, what happened? And we'll go back, and we'll see how the message changed throughout. And so I had a guy just yesterday. He just changed it because he thought it was too much for everybody to remember. That was his answer. <laughs> so I was like, awesome. But the person I start with, I say, okay, so we gave you the message. You're the receiver. What did I do to ensure you had the message, the feedback? And he would say, you asked me to repeat it. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. So you knew it. It started out right. And then the communicator. Kind of like when the general says, I want a car. And what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yeah, he's going to get a car. They're going to start it, right? Hey, go build me a car. All right, so he goes. So they start doing it. Oh, well, wait, wait, wait. Does the general want a car or a truck? Well, he's had a car. What kind of car does he want? Does he want a Prius? Nobody laughs at that. I don't want a Prius. Or, no, he wants a, a Lincoln Town car. Leather, fully loaded. He's a general, man. Tinted windows, the whole, the whole shebang. But nobody will go back and ask the question because it's already started. Just like communication with the telephone. If leadership gives a message or an instruction or guidance or something tells you to do something, and it goes down. Do you think it gets changed on the way down some? Do you think add, people add to and take away? Well, I think this is what his intent was. I'm still in the spirit of AFI, whatever. Or even from the bottom up, right? Communication. There are different types of communication. The communication I want to talk about is interracial, intercultural, interpersonal. And then over 70% of our communication is nonverbal. You can always tell what the airmen are thinking when you say, hey, we got to go pick up cigarette butts. They don't have to say nothing, right? You can just tell by their faces, right? You just want me to hurry up and finish, right? <laughs> All right. But yeah, over 70% over of our communication is nonverbal, just our facial expressions. I go to tech school, they give me this uh, Psych 101, and then push me out the door to my next base, but I don't know what to do with it. They didn't tell me what I was supposed to do with it. They look up, they look down, they look left, right, spatial learner, things like that. But you all don't have to be psychologists to know that person's not happy with what I just said. Or, they, or they're faking it, because now they're smiling, right? I remember when I was in basic, the, the interpersonal, right? The TI's right here, hit me in the head with the hat, yelling at me as loud as he can. I'm like, why is he yelling at me in my underwear? And then he leaves, and I look at the guy next to me. I say, what did he just say? Because I wasn't listening. Because he was in my, my space. And then I was in my underwear, too, so that probably didn't help much either. So, but intercultural, interpersonal. We get complaints from people who just don't understand cultures, value systems. Why? They, they can't understand why you would want such a large family, for example, where I want a small family. The census study did a study. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, and in the study, they said the average white family has two kids. The average black or African American's family has 2.5 children. Don't ask me how you have a half a child. I don't know. And then Asian was like three to four. Hispanic was five to six. Why do you think that is? It's value systems, but what do you think some of the contributors are? I'm sorry? I, I can't hear. Economic, yeah, money. What about religion? Think religion can play a key in having a large family? What's the primary religion or the predominant religion, I should say predominant religion, of Hispanic Latino? Catholic, Catholic contraception, things like that. Or maybe my 
my choice or value is a large family because I like to have the large family at the dinner table, the communication. Or maybe I need a large family to go and make money for the family. Has anybody ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Does anybody want to kind of give me a brief rundown of what it is? Right. So it's, yes, sir. It's a pyramid. And at the bottom is food, shelter. Then it's, it goes up from there, you know, safety. And then at the top is self-actualization. Where do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be. Um, so I use myself as, a, as an example. So the census study said two kids per uh, white family. So guess how many kids I got? Two. I got two. Six and eight, all right? And where I'm looking at self-actualization. I want to retire, maybe do some civil service work, and then retire from that, and then live on the beach and drink beer, right? Not everybody has my value system. It's OK. But I don't want to have any more kids because I'm looking at that retirement where I want to be. And kids are expensive. I got to put them through college. That's a lot of money, right? Where religion may take place. Uh, precedent, or I need the income, or my fulfillment of rich life is not money but a large family. How I see myself is not how others see me. Does that make sense? So what you, how you perceive, man, how do they have such a, they keep having kids and they ain't got no money. Doesn't make sense to me. Makes sense to them. Doesn't have to make sense to you. Does that make sense? But it's all about communication. To go back to that, I got off on a tangent. Um, general wants a car, nobody goes back and asks a question. Or that boss thing. All you got to do is say something. Can I get uh, somebody read the Santa Claus one for me? Or can you not see it? Is this the uncomfortable silence? All right, I'll ask you again, sir. Did you or did you not look at my client? In a crowded shopping mall in front of her children, uh, call her not once, but three times a hope. Uh, in Florida, they, they passed a, a law or a rule that Santa in the mall cannot say ho, ho, ho. He has to say ha, 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 because it was offensive. My point with that is, is we don't want to create that eggshell environment where we are tiptoeing around, worried about what we're going to say, how we're going to do it, because we're worried about offending somebody. We need to get the job done. All right, but at the same time, we can foster an environment that's not uh, or a culture of discrimination, sexual harassment, things like that. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Manis. <laughs> yeah. All right. The other one, I need a new one. It says, I bet my husband's online right now. And the other one, he says, I'm sure my husband's surfing the web. But all right, so can I get everybody to stand up for me, please? Y'all falling asleep. So now nobody can say they weren't moved by my briefing today. <laughs> All right. So we're going to pair up. And there's some rules before you start. So you're going to pair up. If it works out, you got to get in threes. That's fine. Uh, whoever you think the stronger person is is going to make a fist. The other person is going to try to open that fist. Now, as I've learned from dealing with cops in the past, I have to make some more ground rules. <laughs> Don't. No pressure points. Don't scratch nobody. Don't throw nobody over no chairs. All right. Don't break no bones. All right, so stronger person, make a fist, or whoever you think the stronger person is, make a fist. The other person, try to open it. Go. So when you're done, you can sit down. If you're still going, you can stay stand or standing. That's fine. So if you, if you did not get the, their fist open, raise your hand for me. Let me see the hands. So what happened, Chief? Couldn't do it? Couldn't do it? Just too strong? Who else? Who, who else couldn't get it? Who, who else didn't get it open? How about you, ma'am? Too strong? 
Okay. Who got the fist open? How'd you get it open, sir? I asked. Ah, he asked. Anybody else ask? <laughs> what did I just get done talking about for like 10 minutes? <laughs> communication, right? So, communication. We're so ingrained as human beings that I heard stronger, I have to use force. Right? I didn't say, I didn't even tell the person making a fist not to let him open it. But that's how we're ingrained as human beings, especially as military members. The fastest way from A to B is what? Straight line. If not, I'll make my own, and I will get it done. But yeah, you don't need to do his ass. Same thing with EO issues. Talk to him. I mean, 99% of the time, that's, that's what happens. It blows up. It starts with something as simple as that word boss. And then it just keeps going from there. And next thing you know, they're going back and forth. And then it comes to my office. And now it's so big that it's, it's nothing that couldn't have been just solved with a, hey, um, I don't appreciate that. Could you please stop? All right. So prevention strategies, right? What have I been saying the whole time? At least tell me that so I feel like you learned something. Communication. This is a culture, something that's ingrained in us. We have filters. I may think sexual jokes are funny, and the other person may think discriminatory jokes are funny, or this show is funny. But at the end of the day, look at the ripple effect or how it could affect everyone around you. You direct it, and that's how it starts. I've seen entire echelons of leadership from the staff sergeant supervisor to the superintendent fired and removed because they condone an environment of sex discrimination. They had one master sergeant. He was sexually harassing females. So they moved him to another flight. What do you think he started doing? Same thing. Same thing. They didn't document it. That commander PCS'd. New commander comes in. Female files a congressional complaint. Doesn't look good for leadership, does it? All right. The biggest thing we see in the responsibilities is, is everybody should know Zero tolerance, address it. But the problem is, is the addressing, the condoning piece. So when I do an investigation or a clarification and I come in and I have an offender, we substantiate, I have one offender, and I find out you knew about it, in my report I have two offenders now because you condoned it, and that's against Air Force policy. And you can get in just as much trouble as the person who did it, or just as much trouble that the person who did it will get into, depending on the severity of the discrimination, right? NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, has really, Congress has changed how we do business in the Air Force. Commanders, if it's sexual harassment, they're doing a commander-directed investigation. Unless it, our climate surveys are targeting sexual assault and sexual harassment. Commanders will get one within 120 days after the assumption of command and annually thereafter. So they can identify in the beginning, and then they can figure it out in the end if they fix it or not, or what still needs to be done. Those still are anonymous. Don't, don't, I can't even see who did what. We don't track logins or nothing like that. And just remember, uh, anybody, if, if I, I, anybody can go in there and say, Tech Sergeant Manus sucks. Okay? I could type that about myself. Uh, somebody else could type that about me. So names don't mean a whole lot on certain things. Okay? But yeah, we're, it's, you don't want to be that person who is guilty of sexual harassment. It's pretty much career. We have one now, they're in the process of taking a stripe because he told jokes. He told uh, sexual and uh, discriminatory jokes based on uh, race, color, sex. And they're taking the stripe for telling jokes. They're not playing around. All right, so since anybody have any real world scenarios they want to share or do you want me to just read from the slides? No? It's a smaller crowd today than it was. All right, so while in the aircraft maintenance fuel section, Sergeant Kim White was bending over at a 90 degree angle to handle the fuel bucket when Mr. Walter Watts loudly stated, isn't that a tempting sight? A few days later, Mr. Watts put his arm around Sergeant Light and continued on about his marital indiscretions. Mr. Watts removed his arm from Sergeant Little, or Sergeant Light, and continued on by saying, that what his wife didn't know couldn't hurt her as he walked around to the other side of the PR tank. Sergeant Light told him that what her husband didn't know would hurt him. 
Mr. Watts tried to go, uh, tried to go more, into de more into it and realized that the further he was going, the more he was losing his audience. This made Sergeant Light feel extremely uncomfortable. Sergeant Light's co-worker, Sergeant Jonathan Apple, had to take a step back and appear just as confused and uncomfortable with the situation as Sergeant Light. So what are some key things you see in that? I tell you, it goes faster. You just give me the answer, I'll tell you the right one, and we keep going, or we have uncomfortable silence. Unwanted sexual advances, sexual in nature. I, I do like the part where she said her, it would hurt him if it's what her husband didn't know. I thought that was kind of funny. How would you take that? What about Jonathan, Jonathan Apple? What, did he do anything right or wrong? I'm sorry? He went along with it. He took a step back. He was in awe. He could have said, hey, what's going on? Stop. Go away. Inappropriate. Right? Or he may do something after the fact. But if he does nothing, what did he do? He condoned it. So what are some of the sexual harassing behaviors that uh, Mr. Uh, was it Watt? Mr. Watts displayed? Touching. Touching. Now that can be assault or harassment, right? What about, uh, did he linger or stare at her? It doesn't really say that too much, does it? Oh, but he said, isn't that a tempting sight? So now we have the comments, right? But obviously he's, what, lingering, elevator eyes. We could throw all kinds of stuff in there, couldn't we? And it goes from there. But now it hasn't just affected her, it's affected that coworker as well. Here, how about this one? Miss Betty Eggs attempted to establish a relationship with Mr. Sam Bacon by asking him out on dates, interfering in his relationship with his girlfriend, Miss Sally Sue, and by telling him and others in the organization that she is attracted to him and that she and Mr. Bacon are together. Anybody ever had that happen to him? I'm not going to admit it, right? So what, what happened there? Let's see. She asked him out repeatedly. Does it say that? So is that sexual harassment? Yeah. So it's unwanted sexual advances. So pretty much anything with sexual harassment, if, you're, if you feel like you've been sexual harassed, whether it's unwanted or uh, sexual in nature, that, that's the hostile work environment. So pretty much all of it is. All right. But we got the repeated asking. Now she, she's spreading rumors. And you all look at me like I'm, like I'm crazy, but this stuff happens. It's going on. All right. All right, so, yes, sir? Statistically, my question is, men don't normally say they've been sexually harassed. Is that correct? Statistically, I get... Uh, more complaints from females, yes. Men very seldom come in with a sexual harassment complaint. Doesn't mean it happens. And is that a filter, maybe? Because it has to be unwanted, right? No, it's a, it's a man. It's a, it's a movie macho thing. Yes, sir. But what I'm saying is, is if, you know, if a girl, I'll use myself for example. I'm just going to role play. This isn't how I really feel. So if a woman hits on me and she says that I look good. My head's probably going to swell a little bit and be like, yeah, I still got it, but I'm married. <laughs> right? Is that maybe a typical behavior? But does that make it okay? It depends on the individual, right? But if it keeps happening, then yeah. And should you be telling people, you know, they look hot or whatever at work? No. All right? I can tell you that now. Uh, I had a question. Uh, elevator eyes or... The, 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 this came up the other day, men's behavior. They tend to gravitate to women's cleavage. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But my first question is, is why do you have to do that? Right? Learn how not to say the F word. Figure it out, because it can affect you later, or it can affect your work center later. And that's, that's the whole point. And it's all through communication. Changing that mindset, changing that culture, changing that mentality. How I see myself is not how others see me. I may get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and be like, yep, I am one sexy, mm-hmm. And you all may see a little scrawny dork standing up here. I don't know. But it's intent versus impact. All right? I always get the uh, individuals, the rebel flag comes up. 
Is that a hate symbol? Can you, can you display that on base? What do you all think? Huh? Shouldn't? It depends on the installation. If the installation commander has a policy against it, then no. Here at Scott, there is no policy against it. You can display it. But I tell people this, if you're walking down the street and you got it on your car or on your, on your shirt and you're thinking heritage, 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 do you think everybody's going to see it that way? No. They're going to see hate. Some are going to see, some are going to just automatically think that person's a racist. When I was in Germany, we had airmen killed at Frankfurt. And then for a while, we couldn't wear our uniforms off base or to and from work. So people would put them on hangers and hang them in the back window on the side so it stood out better. <laughs> but so for a while, we couldn't do that. And we were, we were told, don't wear any shirts with the American flag downtown. When I put on the uniform or a shirt with the American flag, wh what do you think I'm feeling? Pride, things like that. But if I go downtown, is everybody going to see it that way? Mm -mm. Impact versus intent. How I see myself is not how others see me. <laughs> Just like that iceberg, what's on top isn't necessarily how they're feeling underneath. All right? So, does anybody have any questions for me? Because this, yes, sir? What, what he's saying is, is he, doesn't like, he doesn't like the situation where a bystander can be portrayed as the perpetrator because they didn't say or do anything and then they're, they're getting uh, hit up for condoning. Correct, sir? So with that, and, and there's no cookie cutter approach to EO complaints. I wish there was. It would make it a lot simpler. But the, the end of the day is, is if we see a discriminatory behavior going on or sexual harassment, we have an obligation to stop it or address it. And if we don't, then we're condoning it. And that's just how the policy's written. I think your scenario there of having the rank said it has some significance. Mm -hmm. If that was Staff Sergeant Jonathan Apple was taken back more of what you're saying, he's a condoner. I agree, tend to agree with you. The senior airman is new in the organization mm -hmm. or a rank, and he's now saying this is what is acceptable. I'm uncomfortable in this situation. Mm -hmm. And he could be a, a, a complainant too, yeah. just like what you're saying. It just depends, how did it play out? We don't know. And that's the thing with scenarios, we can, we can go back and forth all day on different perspectives, and I like it because it opens up the, the conversation. But you're right, he could be a complainant, he could be a condoner, he could be uh, either or or both. Who knows, maybe he waited and just went to his first sergeant later or talked to, wanted to talk to her first. So it, it can go several different ways, you're right. Do you guys see any times when say senior airman Apple here doesn't talk to Sergeant White, and maybe not this particular scenario, but just goes straight to reporting because he doesn't want to be an innocent bystander or perceived condoning mm -hmm. bystander. And, and maybe, like what you were talking about, all right, she's talking good about me. Maybe the individual receiving it didn't see it as a... And that happens. Um... We get complaints where the third party will come in and say, hey, this happened, I was offended. And then, obviously, we look into it, and then the person that it happened to says, I wasn't offended by it. Okay. So unwanted or sexual in nature. Okay. So that does happen, yes, sir. But um, before I close, on everybody's favorite slide, because it is my last slide, right? Unless you want me to start over. There's some things I need you to know. If you're a military member and you, you want to use, you feel you've been a victim of discrimination, you have the right, but lowest level possible, confront the person, go to your supervisor, your first sergeant, your commander, director. Utilize your chain of command, that's what it's there for. If not, you can come to our office. However, we don't have confidentiality. I think I said it earlier. 
If you tell me anything under those five, I've got to call you commander. This is who's in my office, this alleged offender, and these are the allegations. All right? If you're a civil, and you need to come within 60 days if you want to file formal. If you're a civilian, you need to come within 45 days, and you have anonymity. They have 100% anonymity. Until they release that, I can't talk about anything to anybody about their complaint. All right? But civilians have to go through the informal, then they go through the formal process. Now, on the civilian side, we're not making a finding like in the military. I'm going to make a finding that's substantiated or unsubstantiated. Civilians, I'm just trying to resolve your concerns. All right? So in the informal process, well, what is it you need? What needs to happen? You know, behavior to stop. Whatever it, your remedies are to get you back to work and, and back as a productive member of the, of the unit. All right? So uh, does, with that said, I'm not going to beat you up too much. And if, you're, if you don't believe that, just call my work phone from, uh, I don't know, a pay phone, if they even have those anymore, and uh, I won't know who you are. Does that make sense? You can always call and ask the questions. If I don't know who you are, I can't do nothing with it. Now, if you tell me I'm Sergeant Manis from the EO office, well, okay, I know where you work now. So I can look into it. So with that, we, we talked about a few things. We talked about Air Force policy, definitions, sexual harassment, the behaviors, the effects it can have on the individual or the work center, we talk perceptions, why, why are we looking at it that way? And what can we do to change that environment? Because you all have to go to work in that environment, I don't. But I know I wouldn't want to go to, to work in a poison environment where every day I dread coming into work, because then now I'm not going to be as productive as what I could be. And I've been in those environments, so trust me, I don't want to work in those. All right? And then we talked about some roles and responsibilities in the scenarios. With that said, are there any questions? Yes, sir? One thing that concerns me is we've got some social liberties that are that something that can offend one person is listed because they're taking it as a if I want to eat a bag of sandwich at my desk, and somebody is a vegetarian or is opposed to pork or any other thing, and gets offended by that during the election of myself, that's becoming the difficult part in society. So finding the line. Finding the, what is offended? You will find somebody who's offended by anything. If you've got 100 people, you've got somebody who's offended by eating a dish. What, what I would say to that is find that reasonable person standard, try to find that line, talk to that person. Maybe that's something you can work out. You know, hey, I want to eat my, at my desk. Is there a time you're not at your desk? Or it, it's just communication. I, I, I take it to the extreme. I just right. in general in society. Not and, and I get that question or comment all the time. But if everybody put uh, what they thought was offensive and we removed it, we would have nothing. There are people who don't like the dictionary, so on and so forth. But that's where we've got to find that line of that common ground. It's, it's a gray area. And, and that's what we need to work to, work to get to as far as members and units and things like that. And, and a lot of that is through communication. It, it's, it's most of the time, we can just work it out amongst ourselves. And if not, that's what our supervisor is for. Hey, help us find the line on this. We're at an impasse. All right. Is anybody else? Yes, sir. I had um, three years ago, a friend of mine actually had this coin on the desk. It was taped to the desk with a tape, tape, so it wasn't going anywhere. So um, she, she finally confided to me what that coin was about. Apparently, this guy was asked her out a couple of times, and so she asked him, she's like, hey, you got a coin? He gave her a coin, and she's like, I'm going to put this coin right in my desk. That coin never goes away, and I'll go out with you. <laughs> and, and, and obviously it worked and that's that's it what works what works for you what's going to work in your situation so any other questions no all right well thank you very much all right next we're going to talk about sexual assault prevention and response and uh from the installation sarp office we have miss pamela dorsey um. Good morning. 
I know that you have already received an awesome briefing from Sergeant Manis. Um, I am Pamela Dorsey, the installation SARC here, and I've been here since the inception of the program. Some of you may already know me. So the foundation that he's already laid, I'm going to just build upon that because we are finding as we're moving forward in the program that it's very important that EO and Sapper collaborate. And the reason why that is often we see the behaviors that are more harassment that can lead to more significant behaviors like assault. So I am just excited that this is the first time that we're stepping out doing something uh, collaboratively and I, I hope that it is beneficial for you to, to paint that picture so you can understand what's going on in some of our work centers. So with that said, this is what we're gonna look at. Okay, I gotta tell you what we're gonna talk about. Of course, the definition, which we do have to discuss, people don't understand. Within the military, our Article 120 is a little bit different than the civilian sector in terms of what we will charge under um, that article. Understanding consent, reporting, continuum of harm, a little bit of bystander intervention. If we have time, I might talk about some scenarios. So as I stated, the definition of sexual assault, why do we have to talk about this? Um, people understand um, sexual assault, what it is, but often when we say that, people think about rape, and when they think about rape, they think about um, penetration, and it's usually that act that they have in their mind that they either saw on television or what they read about. Uh, rape being um, someone who violently overtakes someone else, forces them to have sex, and it's very clear, either in whatever is being read or what you're seeing on the television, that that is rape. But when we look at the definition, I'm gonna see, let you see, or help, hopefully explain clearly how broad it actually is. When we say rape, it's, it's uh, defined as um, sexual assault, is characterized as um, intentional sexual contact that's characterized by uh, the use of force, abuse of authority, threats or intimidation, or when the victim does not or cannot consent. Consent being an integral part of that definition. And what I want you to see is we talk about contact and we talk about acts. The term includes a broad category that comes under our UCMJ. When we talk about an act, We are talking about penetration offenses. When we're talking about contact, we're talking about touching. And then we do get into sodomy, as you can see, which is oral anal sex, attempts, and even consent being a big part of that definition. So when it is that broad, um, I need you to understand, and as I speak to our airmen, um, how significant that is. We know that one in four women between the ages of 18 and 24, one in four, have experienced an attempted or completed sexual assault. How many of you have daughters in that age group? Hands, any? How many of you have sons in that age group? Sons, okay, all right. So when we look at that statistic, that's pretty compelling. Women in their lifetime, the latest research says one in five women. Men under the age of 18. That statistic, which has not changed over the years, is one in six. One in six men under the age of 18 have experienced attempted or completed assaults. That's pretty, I think, prevalent. And then when we look at the amount that are coming to the military, not only men but women, how many are coming in with this as part of their history already? So whenever I stand in front of a group, I feel it's a privilege, and I always am very sensitive to the fact that not possibly, but probably, I have survivors in the audience. So with that said, when I talk about these things, um, I, I just want you to, to be aware of that, not only who's sitting around you, but as we talk about the information, you know, um, I'm hopeful it's not a trigger or that it, it really upsets anyone in, in talking about this information with those statistics. So when we talk about the definition, it's important to know that. Specifically, when we talk about an act, it's penetration of the vulva by the penis, however slight. Okay, we have to say that because that definition just changed over the last couple of years. We had a pretty archaic definition. Rape was defined as um, penetration of the penis into the vagina. I don't mean to, I hope I don't offend anyone in speaking such um, direct terminology. I can't say Mr. Joe or Miss Kitty, you know. We have to use the terms that apply, and I say that to, uh, to hopefully to... Um, soften that and make it a little more comfortable because we are talking about sexual assault. So when we talk about rape, that definition was pretty archaic. Now it's much broader because we talk about penetration offenses that can include digital penetration, which are the fingers, object penetration, 
okay, into any of the orifices to include pineal penetration. So that's much broader when we talk about that. Then when we talk about contact, it's intentional touching, either directly or through clothing or genitalia, anus. And we talk about specific areas now, okay? However, legally, do I have any JA in here? Probably not today. When we talk about the touching part, and they mention those specific areas, actually an element that must be fulfilled is that that touch was done to fulfill sexual gratification. So if I'm touching you, um, Chief, you're sitting up front, so I'm gonna, no, you don't have to stand up. But if I come and I touch you on your knee, that's not one of the areas, but if I'm touching you on your knee to sexually uh, gratify myself, it can be classified as sexual assault in this category. So do you see what I'm saying? And these are fairly new. Why do I spend time on this? Because we have airmen, not only airmen, we have, and we focus on the airmen because they are in an, an age category that's just a risky category. They demonstrate risky behavior. But we see these behaviors in the Xers, wiser, wires, I'm a baby boomer, Okay, right, how many baby boomers in the room? I'm not by myself, yes. Xers, Yers, the 30s, 40s, okay, as well, we see these behaviors. So when we talk about this crime, I don't want, often we focus and say, oh, that's the young people that are doing that, no. I do have young people that are doing things called titty twisting, okay, everybody know what titty twisting is? Yeah, everybody, some don't. Okay, they go up to another guy maybe and, and just twist the titties. Twist the nipples, either between the, uh, through the clothes, or it can be done in, in when they're um, playing in the gym. Well, remember the statistic I just shared with you. We don't know what a person's walked through. So that could be very offensive. It's offensive anyway. It would definitely be, be for a woman. We don't even have to, have to talk about that, right? But for a man to come up and just, you know, think that's funny, ah, oh, you know, gotcha, titty twisting. Okay, touching. Contact. The other one thing that, that's kind of, uh, I don't want to say common, but it's happening, it's called teabagging. Everybody know what teabagging is? Yeah. Yeah. They think some people at parties think that's a fun thing to do. Teabagging basically is a guy typically passes out, and another guy will take off their underwear and rub their scrotum, walk across their face and let their scrotum rub across their face. Teabagging. Okay? Touching. Contact. So when we talk about this definition, we have to understand what it involves. Remember I, growing up, and I am older, you know, my grandmother used to say, keep your hands to yourself, right? Keep your hands to yourself. Well, I try to, we need to keep our hands to ourselves. You know, even playing. Under this definition, some things can be charged. Another thing is, as someone passes out at a party and they stick maybe a sausage in their mouth. Take a picture of that, all right? Um, now, can, again, they have to fulfill the elements that these things were done to fulfill sexual gratification, but certainly it could be deemed an assault. That person can come and charge that. So when we're talking and we're going to talk about culture because that's what I'm pointing at, the things that are going on in our culture. Some things are very um, new, but there's nothing new under the sun, really. In our gen my generation, we were doing things that were pretty kind of risky, you know, coming up through the X's and Y's, I think the same thing could be said. But we need to look at that and how that influences behavior today. So sexual contact, the touching piece, people don't understand that in the military, it can be charged under one, Article 120, it can be court-martialed, whereas in the civilian sector, you know, if you tell someone, you know, this guy titty twisted me, they may not do anything with that. They may not take that charge or may not take it seriously. Everybody following me? Any questions or comments on that? A little surprising, isn't it? So I know some of you are thinking I'm going to go back and talk to my son today <laughs> or my daughter. So as we go forward, sodomy, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's always been there. It's just been in another article. They've now rolled it up under Article 120. We know that it is oral and anal sex. Some people don't know that sodomy is defined as oral sex as well. So if you're forcing someone to have oral sex on you um, or uh, on someone else, that it can be charged under that. So it's important that we have an understanding of the definition so we know um, the kind of behaviors that need to be uh, watched and modified. Consent, um, this is the gray line. When I'm speaking and whenever alcohol is involved in a situation, I ask individuals, how do you know you have consent if both of you have been drinking? Because this is the definition. It has to be words or overt, overt acts. I have to be saying or showing to you that I, it's freely given 
by a competent person. So I'm not drunk, I'm not passed out, I'm not incapacitated, I'm freely comp competent, I'm letting you know either by words or by my behavior that consent is there. So when I say whenever a person's impaired, that means they've been drinking a lot of alcohol, how do you know that there's consent? Well, that's an integral part of that definition, and it has to be proven. So I let, when we, when we um, really teach this, it's important that I hope when I'm speaking to our FTAC, our young airmen, um, and it's alcohol, I hope the light bulb comes on that I don't know that I have consent because that's what I want them to know. And I tell them, okay, you've met this person just this night and having a good time and all of that. Social sex is kind of common. That's kind of the culture. And if she's beautiful tonight, all of that, you met her, she's really hot and all of that. She'll be beautiful tomorrow, maybe. Because if you're drinking, okay, vision kind of gets blurred, doesn't it? So um, this is the message that we send in terms of consent, and it has to be a decision that each individual makes when alcohol is involved. So um, we have some societal things that come into play in terms of cultural influences. There's something called victim blaming, and we have to clarify that consent's not there if I just had sex with you an hour ago, but now I'm saying no. Consent's not there if we were in a relationship a year ago. Consent's not there if I'm wearing a tight dress with skinny and all of this and uh, my um, breasts are exposed and they say my sisters are talking, that's what the young people say. All of that, that's not giving you consent to um, inappropriately touch me or even violate me. Some people think that it is because culturally, people would say what well, that individual must be asking for. It must have been a yes, she left with him. Must have been a yes, they were petting or kissing or fondling, so it was a yes. So when she comes forward and says no, there was a point when I said no, did not want that to happen. Um, it becomes very uh, cloudy societally because many people walk away think it was her fault. You know, yes, men get assaulted, so I don't want to, and, and yes, most men would never rape. I need to say that up front, most men never would. Research bears that out. But those that do, do it more than once. And societally, when it's a female that maybe does not fit the mold of that good girl, you know, and what's a good girl? You know, she's a virgin every time. She has clothes up to here, down to here, in her ankles. When she's not fitting the societal mold of what a good girl is, then, Typically, they say, probably it was her fault. It has to be her fault, you know, because only bad girls get raped. So when we look at uh, the consent, those kind of things have to be taken into consideration. So this is the boring part. I want you to stay with me. Don't leave. Have to go over this every time, because reporting is still as clear as mud, all right? The whole program was stood up to allow active duty members to include the Guard and the Reserves in the appropriate status, the ability to report their assault and maintain confidentiality. We have now included dependents over the age of 18 who can get what we call a restricted report. So I just want to bring those up. Restricted report maintains confidentiality. However, it has to be reported in a very specific way or to very specific people. That information has to come to the SARC, a healthcare provider, a victim advocate, or the chaplain. Has to get there and there only. If it can be maintained in those agencies, we can maintain that person's confidentiality. Because whenever that information gets to command chain, they are uh, mandated reporters and they have to report it. It can't uh, be maintained confidentiality. So who can make a restricted report, as I said, Guard and Reserve, active duty, and the appropriate status, and now um, dependents over the age of 18. So let's say we have a civilian who's a GS civilian who's married to active duty. They're assaulted by someone else. It has to be someone else. If it's that husband, then it goes to a different agency altogether. They're assaulted by someone else. They potentially could get a restricted report because they're a dependent, okay? So for unrestricted reports, this is the way it's always happened. Typically, an investigation occurs whenever the command chain knows, secure, um, security forces, OSI, commander, immediate supervisor. That's all part of the command chain, all right? If I say a commander who's on G-series orders, but the person is not in, the, in your unit, not in your unit, not in your command, but you find out about it somehow. You, you get the information that um, Jane Doe was raped by Tommy whomever, do you have an obligation to report that, sir? I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, I think. Yes, G-series orders. So there are some situations that are not defined in our AFI 
that AFI says, command chain, immediate supervisory uh, security forces, OSI, okay? But it doesn't say a commander in another chain. Would they have a responsibility? They have a duty. Say a chief master sergeant, you find out about it. Individuals not in your, in your unit. Do you, are you required to report? Yes. Yeah, why would you be? You're, they're not in your chain, let's say. Yet. And this is where I have to clarify. Because just because um, your answer is right, you're right, sir. Yeah, yeah. Duty. You have a duty to, basically, even though it's not stated in our AFI. So reporting is very important. Remember our two, uh, 256 SARC is our 24 7 number. If you ever have a question, just call the SARC and we'll figure it out, okay? So with that, Let's talk about culture a little bit. These behaviors are really driven by something that I call secondhand smoke, all right? Some baby boomers are in here. So you remember the time, maybe, when we could sit at our desks. I used to smoke, I've, been, I've quit for 20 years, okay? But I used to smoke. Um, there was a time when we could sit at our desk with our ashtray, smoke our cigarette, typing on the computer. See, I just lost some people. Uh, typing on a typewriter, I'll say. Just lost some people, right? They've never said it. With our cigarette, and that was totally accepted in our culture. Totally accepted. We, uh, however, those individuals who worked with us were exposed to our secondhand smoke, even though they didn't want to have, you know, that wasn't their choice, but it was part of the culture. Well, we've been able to, in the military, change that culture where it's not even cool to smoke anymore. People smoke, and you kind of get that dirty look like, you're smoking? You know, that's disgusting, all right? But the effects of the secondhand smoke to those individuals who were in that office, they were affected by it. Culture is the same way. So what we're seeing in our culture affects how we behave, how we perceive women, how we've been socialized as genders. And what that, what that means, if I were to ask, um, what's the difference between sex and gender, what would you say? Someone have the answer? The difference between sex, I don't mean the act or the activity, and gender. Sometimes I have a psychology major in here, in the, in the group. Let's take a guess. What's that? Okay. Explain physical and... Your sex would be your physical, what you have physically and mentally. People can have a different mindset of what their gender is. That's awesome. Did everybody hear that? High five in the air. Woo! Okay, so people don't often get that. Sex is what you're born with. You're born male or female for the most part. There, are, there is an anomaly that can occur where you're born with both. Sex is what you're born with. Gender is how you believe what you are in that sex. All right, you with me? So, and I'm gonna just use male, female, although gender is affinity, okay? When we talk about gender, because we, get the, we have the LGBTQ community, you're, sure, you're familiar with that, I'm sure. Okay, um, but I'm just gonna speak male, female. We've all been socialized to believe what we are as men and as women. So if I were to define what a man is, what's a man? Give me some adjectives. What? A man is? Macho. macho. A man is? Strong. A man is? Provider. A man is? What's that? Superior? I heard that, I heard it, and I saw who said it. <laughs> I heard that, and that's true. That's true. Societally, men are, are, are social, um, yeah, socialized to believe, superior or what's another word that might be more accepting to people? Dominant. Dominant. Are they entitled maybe? A little bit of entitlement there? And this is, this is we're just talking um, what I call real talk. All right, not, what's that? Protector. Protector, yes. So those are words that are assigned to manhood. That's why it's so difficult when a man is raped to come forward and, and, and report that because it speaks against everything they've been socialized to believe who they are as men. Men are masculine, men are strong, men are macho. Are men emotional? Well, some men, I know some men. No, typically, they are not. So if we assign those terms to men, when we speak about women, what are women then? What? Nurturer? Nurturer? Meek. Meek. Feminine? Weaker. Weaker. What's that? 
Meaner. <laughs> Meaner, moody. Are women emotional? Yes. So in our culture, if these terms weaker, I want you to hold on to. Um, emotional, hold on to that. Men, they're stronger. They're dominant, maybe even entitled. When we have those terms, when we look at the culture, how people even perceive themselves in the culture, now let's look at it in what I'm going to reduce to a rape culture. So when we talk about culture, just so we're on the same page, what is it? This is how we're going to define it. Customary beliefs are social, that should be norms, I apologize, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group shared by people in a place or time. Okay, so when we talk about culture, just real quick, because this is easy for me, if you go back to 1970, do you think about some certain things? Excluding the drugs. <laughs> right, bell bottoms, psychedelic, you know, it had a certain culture to it. When free sex, all of that, right, um, peace. So when you think about a culture and a time and a group of people, think about that generally. Okay, that group, you can even talk about religion. Generally, these are the beliefs of that group that, that affects the culture. So, to make it a little more specific, if we come down and look at the military, the military has its own culture. That's why society holds us to a greater standard, because they are also familiar with our culture. This is a security force member or a handler jumping out of the back of the plane with his dog. I mean, where do you see that? I don't know if they push the dog out of the back of the plane or not, but I mean, where do you see that? I think that's awesome. You know, we are... Um, we do unique and phenomenal things in the military. Um, I am Air Force, I grew up Air Force, retired Air Force, so I'm a little biased, you know. So um, society looks at us the same way. And we're gonna relate this and lay this on, juxtapose this on the rape culture and what's going on in the military in terms of sexual assault and why it's so, so, so egregious to society. No different than society, but because it's happening in the military. So when we look at the military, it also has its own culture. We're physically fit, that's part of our culture, that's what we believe as in as a group of people. Our uniform, we wear it a certain way, we wear it with pride, that's also part of our culture, it's an expectation, we all believe in that as a group of people. And additionally, women now are part of, this, of the military culture, and I have to say, insert that because it wasn't always the case. Women have just been allowed to go into um, war, uh, yeah, war areas or take in AFSCs that would put hit them at war in the 90s. Recent, that's fairly recently, okay? So to take all that into consideration and, and military being a predominantly a patriarchal society, that's not an offensive term, I'm just you know, speaking factually. Anybody disagree with that? And looking at all of these things as we talk about culture. So now we talked about general culture, military culture, and why it's so important to understand rape culture. Because that's also a culture. And that culture can be found in specific units. That culture can be found in organizations or society. And if we were to define it, it's very interesting. It's a concept used to describe a culture in which sexual violence or harassment behaviors are common. And in which prevalent attitudes, norms, practices, and media normalize, excuse, or tolerate, even condone these behaviors. Okay, let me peel that back just a little bit very quickly. When we talk about the cultural influences, all right, and you might even be thinking about your children right now or our younger airmen right now, what has influenced them? When we look at the media, music, certain practices, social norms, the sexting, the group sex, that's, be that's becoming fairly common, okay? Meeting someone the same night, having sex with them, Alcohol, binging, all of that, fairly common in the society. Um, excuse or tolerate the music. Um, uh, I don't do MTV, I don't watch a lot of the videos, but if you look about the violence that's juxtaposed on top of sexual behavior, okay, and that's being part of our um, culture, society, what, what's being exposed is like that secondhand smoke. You following me? We don't even notice some things in marketing. I do not like Hardee's for their commercials. I don't know if anyone saw Miss Turkey Burger or some of the Hardee's commercials that are coming out. They are absolutely, look at the sexual innuendos that's tied into a hamburger, okay? Look at clothing. How many have little children? 
maybe girls between the ages of eight and 12, the clothes that, that are, they're selling right now, they expose a lot of skin. Culturally, parents buy them their thongs for little girls eight and nine years old. Cultural influence, okay? Everything is sexualized. Everything is about exposing the body. Not too different from when you can go back to the Roman Empire and how, um, you know, that all, nothing's new under the sun, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But we have to recognize these influences. So when we talk about how that feeds into the rape culture, how you maybe grew up and was socialized to believe as a man or a woman, how you carry that into maybe even your behaviors. You may think it's okay to tell a blonde joke. You may think it's okay to te tell a racist joke, depending on how you were raised, how you, how you grew up. Sexually, sexist jokes might be just fine. You know, cussing, saying the B word, saying the F word. You know, even taking a feel when you feel like it, that may be fine. That may be even accepted in your work center. That might be something that's done and, and looked over in, in organizations. Our work group gender, uh, our gender relations work group analysis that was done in 2012, and they're doing a RAND survey right now. Some people may have taken it. Are you taking it? Has anyone in here taken the RAND? Yeah, some people have. It's going to extract the data that we used from 2012. And one of the things that was so compelling that came out of that was units that condone sexual harassment behaviors that the women in that unit are six times more likely to be assaulted. I thought, whoa, that is a pretty compelling uh, correlation there. So if we make sure units don't support that behavior, we can automatically reduce um, putting women at risk. Okay, so when we, when we look at the rape culture and the things that influence it, those are the things that we, we are looking at. So. What are some rape uh, culture examples? What would they look like? Blaming the victim. A victim comes forward, I was assaulted, I was raped, I was harassed. We don't believe them. We question them, we, well, where were we? Why do you think that? Well, did you tell them to stop? And how many times did he did that, do that? And for some, in some um, um, situations, that might be absolutely correct if it's going through a CDI or an investigation on the harassment side. But on, when it becomes now a crime, and I'm gonna show you the continuum of harm and what that looks like, the, the victim in that violent crime is questioned. Her integrity, her character, her background, she is the one that's put on trial. So victim blaming is very prevalent, a societal kind of mindset. It's an enigma to me. It's just, why do we do that? Someone can have their car broken into and they had, had their garment in there and the person said, okay, well, why were you parking there? Or maybe the car, why did you leave your car unlocked? Certainly that behavior might have been risky, but automatically going to blaming that individual. So when we talk about rape culture, that's one, sexual explicit jokes, all of these feed into and support a rape culture. Some people get very upset about the last one. They feel that our training today, we spend a lot of time teaching women how to avoid getting rape versus teaching men not to rape. Well, that's a cultural change. That's a valid statement, but you have to understand that it's a generation to change mindsets, to change a culture. So I believe we can do it in the military, and we're gonna do it like we change the smoking. We're gonna change the attitudes about inappropriate and inappropriate behaviors. I do believe that. So these things all support a culture um, that supports rape. How can we combat it? I'll let you read through that. One of the greatest fears of a victim is coming forward and report, regardless if it's harassment or assault, of not being believed. It's one of the greatest fears. There are many barriers, but that's one of the greatest, that they'll come forward and say this, and maybe it's about um, you know, a boss, or maybe it's about a, a stellar person that works in the unit, nobody's gonna believe me, um, so they don't come forward because of that. And this is how we combat it. Avoid using language that objectifies or degrades women. That's all common sense. We did that work group in um, welfare inspection back in 2012, end of 2012, coming into 2013. And I think everybody was shocked about the, the materials that they continued to find in work centers. We thought that by this time, SAP, the SAPA program had be, 
been stood up since 2005, EO was doing their job, nobody, we wouldn't find those kind of materials. And it wasn't 500 pieces, it was thousands of pieces of inappropriate material. So um, this is how we combat it. When I talk about the continuum of harm, this is where EO just really, we just collaborate well. If we can deal with these lesser behaviors, the sexist jokes, the inner, improper internet searches, and the way pornography and, um, is accessible today is still playing into that rape culture because it continues to objectify women. Women are also um, becoming addicted to pornography as well. And I say addicted because it is a sexual addiction. And it's more prevalent than people want to talk about. And the, the excess is through these iPhones. I mean, a person doesn't have to go on a government computer to do it. So to acknowledge that that's there, to address that, I, and I think addressing that is really in training, um, comments about a person's body, all of those inappropriate behaviors on that end of the continuum. If we can address those, then we won't get to the, to the right side, the more significant, because once touching happens, then we're talking about a crime. And are we saying someone says, who tells a sexist joke is gonna commit rape? No, again, we're talking about the culture and what supports those kinds of behaviors. Any questions? No, okay. So, we all know what this is. What is keeping that, who, what's supporting that pyramid? What really keeps it up? The, I heard it. Foundation. The foundation of that pyramid. They built it so well over the thousands of years that it is still standing. When we talk about culture and what's really supporting it, it's these things, the foundational pieces. This is another way of looking at that continuum of harm. We can see the jokes, the language, and I do say language because that's also a part of the culture. Objectification, traditional roles, title, um, Nine, yes, education, glass ceiling, 0.76, that is even today, I think they just voted in, in Congress in terms of women's pay, that's women make 76 cents per every dollar a man makes. So that's still culturally, not so much in the military, you know, uh, chiefs get paid the same, colonels for the most part get paid the same, those salaries are consistent, but um, societally not so much. Verbal abuse, it moves up. So it's the foundation. If we begin to deal with those things, we're going to reduce the amount um, that we see at the top. So we have to reset the culture. One of the things that I think is the most powerful tool is bystander intervention. Bystander intervention is, is, is uh, resetting, helps to reset the culture in terms of our behavior and how we respond when we see inappropriate behaviors. So when I talk about that, uh, by center behaviors, I also always have to explain why people don't. Because I don't want people to walk away feel, blaming themselves or thinking, pointing a finger saying someone's not doing, she's saying that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. When a group of people see something going on, it could be someone's behavior or it can be an emergency situation, there's a couple, some psychological phenomenons that occur. Um, social psychologists have pointed out two main ones, pluralistic ignorance and diffusion of responsibility, which contributes to people not moving out. Pluralistic ignorance says when a group of people are seeing something go on and a person sees that no one else is doing anything, I conclude it must not be as bad as I think it is, okay, so I don't do anything. When in fact, there are many people who are seeing it the same way I do and feel the same way I feel about it. I'm just ignorant to that. So it prevents me from moving out because I don't think it must not be that bad. You know, Chief saw it or the Colonel saw it or the Shirt saw it or whomever, there was a group that saw it. it must not be as bad as I think it is, so I don't move out. And I'm saying there's probably people that feel the same way you do, move out. The other one is diffusion of responsibility. That's when a group of people see something and they don't move out because they think someone else is gonna take care of it. Okay, Kitty Genovese, many people, if you heard about that story, 28 year old, New York, came home, middle of the night to three o'clock in the morning and she's attacked in front of her apartment, she's screaming, people are yelling out the window, leave her alone, leave her alone, but nobody really does anything because they're hearing other people scream, say leave her alone, they thought someone else was gonna take care of it, so they didn't move out, okay? It's like the person who falls out with a heart attack, someone, if I were to fall out right here, you'd probably, well no, not here, we're trained. But, People typically stop and freeze, don't they? And to that person who's trained comes up and starts directing. Go call 911, go do this, go do that. This is the phenomenon that happens psychologically in the brain when people are seeing something, they're trying to process this and figure it out. So when we talk about bystander intervention, we have to get past and beyond that. 
When you see something that's inappropriate and you know it's inappropriate, you just do. You, you know, that's, it's, we're in the work center, it's professional, that's, that's inappropriate, it's unprofessional. We know we need to say something about it. We need to address it. Um, and that's all that's speaking to. So with that, I know we're coming right up on 11. I would rather take questions. I can go through a scenario here real quick um, and just see hands, or I can take questions. Are you running this show today? You are, okay. Chief King, um, or I can take some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So we, a couple months ago in our division, had a sapper stand down day, four hours of training, yeah. and the reporting became very contentious to the point that we had to stop and contact the SARC's office on speakerphone. Okay? I remember that. <laughs> so uh, I researched the AFI after that because I'm still, as a Chief Master Sergeant today, I thought I had understood my responsibilities with reporting mm -hmm. until that day. Okay. What I understood was as a military member trained in SAPR, and my role is just a military member. If a person outside of my supervision, I wasn't in their chain of command, mm -hmm. shared with me that they had been sexually assaulted, mm -hmm. that I believe that day before the training, I had a responsibility to report it to my chain of command. Mm -hmm. That ignorance was corrected that day. Whereas I, as outside, not in the supervisory chain of command, mm -hmm. what you had on your slide mm -hmm. being a commander, mm -hmm. being an individual in, in a G-series capacity, mm -hmm. that my role is to encourage that individual, mm -hmm. and as we were told, to go see the SART. Mm -hmm. My research of the AFI actually suggested that's not correct. Mm -hmm. It says that my role as just a person in the military not affiliated with chain of command is to encourage the individual to go to OSI. Mm -hmm. that, that is what the AFI says. So when, when we covered it in the slide, I'm even more confused now because you said, hey, as a chief, what is your responsibility? What is your duty? Mm -hmm. And I submit to you, I don't know. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you again. Mm -hmm. So um, you have a duty to ensure that person is taken care of. And we say, get them to the SARC. Okay, you're not in their immediate chain of command. You're not a mandated reporter. A mandated reporter has to call a SI and the SARC, all right, you're mandated. It's gonna go into investigation. You can get them to the SARC, SARC's gonna call, if you are in the immediate chain of command, mandated reporter, you can call the SARC and SARC is gonna call OSI because you're in the chain of command. If you're not in the chain of command, you send a person, you get them to us, which is what I encourage, because if we can get them under restricted reporting, there's not gonna be an investigation. You have no obligation as a person not in their chain, you're gonna to have to show me um, that in the AFI because that's not, in the AFI as I have read it, and we do have a new one coming on board, oh great, it needs to happen, um, to where you have to report that, no. Because if that was the case, everybody would have a duty to make sure OSI is informed, if you're, if you're a friend. And even though our reporting statistics is only 20% of all people who are assaulted report, only 20%, we know 99% tell somebody, okay? And it's usually a friend someone they trust. So even with those individuals, ma'am, if you were not in the chain of command of somebody and they came to you, I would encourage you to get them to the SARC. To me, as a senior NCO, that's a duty to take care of that person. You know, they may not want to go immediately, but not to disengage until you get them connected. You know, they have a better chance because this, this process is not easy once they do come forward. So Chief, if you can send that to me, if I'm misreading something, I need to know that, okay? Pamela.dorsey at us.af.mil. That's a great question. Our whole focus is the victim. The process was stood up to, uh, to protect them as much as we possibly can. It's very clear in the AFI who the mandated reporters are. Very clear. Okay? And we had to, I came, as we looked at that, said, okay, although you're not as chief outside of a person's chain of command it doesn't say you're a mandated reporter but i would say you'd have a duty i would say a commander who's not in that person's unit who who hears about it on g-series orders i would say they have a duty would you agree yes ma'am so what if you mentioned encouraging them to go to this the sergeant what if you keep encouraging them to 
choose not to do so, mm -hmm. do you have a duty to report that? Call me. Call me. And we've had that happen. Um, yes, call me because I would help facilitate. Typically, I've never had a person who would not come over and put a restricted report in place. Once they understood there's no investigation, nobody's going to know, but they run a risk of people finding out, depending on the situation, every case is different. You know, if it happened at a party, if it happened, somebody else knows. Um, I've had someone who had a restricted report, and a year and a half later, a first sergeant heard about it, somehow got a hold of this information, and wanted to speak to this person, called us, is there a person you have a restricted I can't, no, I, I can't. I can't confirm or deny. We got that victim back in our office and let them know this is going on. If you're called by OSI, you don't have to say anything, nothing, because you have a restricted report. They can call you and you don't have to say a thing. I don't know what you're talking about. And that's what happened. And we were able to protect her restricted report. Now, that's called an independent report. Is OSI still going to go into an investigation? Yes. But do they have a case if they don't have a victim? No. So it gets really sticky. That's a great question. Yes. So it's challenging, but there's some way to simplify the complexities of it's more legal than it seems to be moral. And maybe that's the poor choice of work. What if you have a scenario where you have a military member and a civilian who would assault a military member? Mm -hmm. You touched on that, how you would relate to the civilian authorities, or if you would, if you would. We have a military member and they. Female assaulted by a civilian. Okay. Male. Mm hmm. Did it happen on what base or off base? Happen? Yeah. It happened off base. Okay. So it gets complicated. Her, option? okay. her options is she can still report it. Okay. We still supply, um, give her advocacy, all of the services that are available. But what we are going to run into is jurisdiction. Okay, since it's off the base and it's a civilian person, if it was off the base and it was a military person, we have more control of that. But it's a civilian person. So we've got a case right now, military person, um, the victim, subject is civilian, and it's going to be tried downtown. But remember, they try them kind of differently than we do. You know, OSI would love to take control of those, but it becomes a jurisdiction issue. So it would also become a Well, if she comes to us and says this has happened and she wants a restricted report, she doesn't want anybody to know, then nobody's going to know. And what we do is provide, make sure she gets medical, make sure she gets advocacy, follow up. You know, we support her through that. She's, she even has the ability, opportunity to have an SVC, a Special Victims Council, which is a military JAG that doesn't work for the JAG office on, on this installation. They report up to uh, half somewhere, okay? But they um, advocate on behalf of the victim legally, not their counsel if it were to go to court, but letting them know, let's say it happened off base, the subject, uh, I live off base, subject lives 10 blocks from me, I want to get out of this lease and move somewhere else. The SVC would help them do that legally. So they have been a great addition to the services that we offer. It gets very complicated. And that's probably a very simplistic answer. Yes. Yes, sir. I think I'm a little confused, so please clarify. If I can. Okay. So if a person comes to you and you have what you call a restricted report, is there any action that happens? Or is this just, and I ain't trying to be funny, no. is this just a paperwork shuffle? No, this is a taking care of that victim okay, focus. I mean, so nothing happens. Happen nothing happens. That's the whole purpose, as I um, explain, tried to explain, maybe not clear enough, in the very beginning. The whole program was stood up to allow active duty members to include the Guard and the Reserve in the appropriate status, as well as now, dependence over the age of 18, the ability to report us an assault and there be no investigation. Where does the process of the perpetrator get it up become a only if they want to restrict it. action? Go ahead and explain. Well, only if they want to restrict it. Only if it, yeah. the victim. It allows the victim to get the care without having everybody in the unit find out about it. It allows that victim to go forward and get that medical attention, talk to counselors, and be able to have that, that treatment without having to have interviews and multiple trips to OSI or court cases and things like that. It, it sort of, Perfectly designed for that victim. 
Now, if they he want wants to, she or he wants to, that person prosecuted, what he did was wrong. I want to know she did is wrong. I want it taken care of. Then they do an unrestricted okay. report, OSI, uh, chain of command, interviews, uh, expedited transfers. Okay, now right. they can what phone now? Yeah. Yeah. So now? Oh, she's doing awesome. Don't stop her now. Yeah. Keep going, man. Transfers too. If you work in the same organization and you want that person moved, they'll they will move the other person, or you can ask to be moved too. So that's also within the, I think about the last year. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Awesome. High five in the air. Woo. Legal question or procedural question? If there's a confidential report filed or whatever the, the term is, restricted. 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 Mm -hmm. Does that preclude from ever going? forward with action if the victim determines they want to go forward? No, that's a great point. If someone comes forward restricted, they, they can turn it as a Colonel, what's your last name? Jordan. Jordan. As she explained very well, they can turn it to unrestricted later to go forward in investigation. That was a hope uh, of the program when it first started. They said, if we give that victim an opportunity to decide, because remember, all control's been taken from them. If a person's violated, they didn't have a decision in that. So they come and report, we give them an opportunity to make the decision about what they want to do, if they can report it restricted. So later, if they turn it into unrestricted, which they can, then we can go forward in investigation. However, if a person comes forward and reports unrestricted, they cannot turn it restricted. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. But they only keep the medical evidence because they'll take them to a doctor, but they only keep it for a year, I thought. Correct? Yeah, it just changed. Okay. Are you familiar? Awesome. Um, where do you work? Need you on our team somewhere, you know? <laughs> we just had some huge changes over the last three years. National Defense Authorization Act, as you know, Congress has been all over this. Um, but what I do appreciate is they've been putting their, their uh, action where their mouth has been. They're not happy, and they are incorporating legislation, though, which is very, very good. One of them is the big change for um, evidence, we now hold it for five years, okay? But the all, other thing that they incorporated, which I think is awesome, is the paperwork is maintained now for 50 years. And we have a computer database where we upload these forms, so it'll be there. Why is that so important? Many people get assaulted. Let's say I got assaulted as an airman. I got assaulted as a lieutenant. I don't retire for 25 years. I tell no one. But I have gotten, so, had so many, uh, let's say, mental health issues, um, stress, anxiety, that when I retire, I go to the VA. And now, you know, it's, to, it's about benefits. It's about care. And of course, MST is very real, military sexual trauma. They can pull up, even if it was restricted. They can go back and say, okay, you, got, you were assaulted in 2012, 2014. They had that system, we can, pull, we can pull that documentation up. We can get it, which I think is wonderful. Great questions. Anything else? Any other? Well, I appreciate your comments and being engaged. Um, that lets me know you're thinking. I know it's not the most, I try to be funny, but I'm not a real com comedian. And it's hard with this topic um, because it is serious. Um, but I do appreciate what you are doing. I, like I said, most men would never rate. Leaders are good leaders. We have great leaders on this installation. Um, we just have to keep, uh, I think, the fire burning, you know, we, we will change the culture. No secondhand smoke. Reduce it. Okay? Thank you for your time.